Today we begin a new series on the subject of dating, and I want to speak for the next four weeks on, on dating, and uh, I told you last week that even though it's dating, it's for married couples also, and then in the month of September, I'll be doing a series on marriage. You know, there was a time in my life where I had a huge interest in dating, first of all, because I was dating, but then when my kids were dating, I wanted to understand and know as much as possible so that I could guide them and I could help them as much as I could. Now they have kids, and it's their turn to learn as much as possible about dating so that they can guide their kids. As a matter of fact, some of you that are here today, you, want, you might want to make sure that if you have kids that are dating, that you give those that are dating them multiple copies of this series because it's going to really help them. Make it a requirement and tell them, before you can date my daughter or you can date my son, you need to listen to Pastor Vic's series on the art of dating, and I promise you it's going to help them. You know, I, I'm not ignorant to the fact that dating is a cultural thing. You know, different cultures have, cultures have different rules about, about dating. Of course, I grew up in the Mexican culture, and we have certain rules about, uh, about dating. But I was reading the story about a Mexican mother-in-law. And a young Mexican-American guy was excited because he had fallen in love. And one day he tells his mother, Mother, I'm falling, I'm falling in love, and I'm going to get married. And he says, Mom, just for the fun of it, I'm going to bring over three women, and you try and guess which one I'm going to marry. So the mother says, Okay, son, go ahead. So the next day, he brings three beautiful women into the house, sets them down, and they all chat with mom and they for a while. And then after they're done chatting and talking, he then turns to mom and says, okay, mom, guess which one I'm going to marry. And without, you know, skipping a beat, she took the one in the right. That's the one you're going to marry. And the guy's amazed. The guy says, grandma, my mom, that's amazing. How did you know that? And the Mexican mom replied, I don't like her. That's why. <laughs> true. <laughs> How many of you know that uh, for the Mexican-American mom, no girl is good enough for their son, and no son is good enough for the girl? So that's what that reflects. That's cultural. Now, as a context, what I want to do is I want to give you some trends. I want to talk to you today on the purpose of dating, but I want to give you some trends that we're seeing these days regarding dating and marriage. You know, marriage rates have been declining in the last several decades here in America. The number of American adults who have never married as it is at an all-time high. Now, I don't want to bore you with statistics, but let me give you some numbers just to sort of set the context and help you understand and, and frame our, con our conversation today on the subject of dating. In 2012, one in five adults, and the reason 2012, right after the census, they looked at this information, and they found that one in five adults, age 25 and older, that was about 42 million people at the time, had never been married according to an analysis of census data. Now compare that to 1960, when it was only one in 10 adults, age 25 and older, never had been married. 2012 data also shows that men are more likely than women, men at 23%, women at 17% to have never been married. In 1960, it was 10% of men, age 25 and older, never married, and 8% of women of the same age had never married. Now why, the question we have to ask is, and that is asked, is why are less adults getting married? There's a lot of reasons for that. Number one is, first of all, adults are marrying later in life. You know, it used to be that if you got past 25, you were sort of beyond the marriage age. But now, a lot of people are getting married after 25. That's the number one reason. The second reason uh, people are, less adults are getting married, is that more couples, more and more couples are living together outside of marriage. And they're raising children outside of marriage. About a quarter, or 24% of never married young adults, ages 25 to 34, when surveyed, say that they are in a relationship and they are cohabiting and they are living with the partner. So in a way, they, are, they have what are called common law marriages, but they are not literal marriages where they get a license and follow the, the normal patterns of marriage. Number three, the third reason why less are getting married, uh, married is because public opinion about marriage has changed in the last 50 years. The American public is deeply divided over the role of marriage and, the, role, and what it, the importance of it in our society. You say, well, why do you say that? Well, this is what the data shows. 46% of adults believe that society is better off if people make marriage and having children a priority. In other words, 46% of those surveyed in America believe that it is, if you're going to have children, the best way to have them is to be married, and marriage is a good thing to do. 50% believe that society is just as well off 
if people have priorities other than traditional marriage and, you know, and, and of course, having children. In other words, marriage does not hold the esteem, the respect that it had at one time. Here's the fourth thing that you need to know. In general, shifting public attitudes, hard economic times, and changing family patterns, homosexual marriages are all contributing to the rise of never married adults. You know, in the last couple of years with the legalization of, of gay marriages, we're going to see the number of those not married drop because now they can declare themselves as being married. Here's another thing you need to know. About half of all never married adults, 53%, say they would like to marry eventually. That's down from 2010 when 61% of never married adults uh, said they would like to marry. One third or 32% of today's never married adults say they're not sure if they would like to ever get married. And 13% say definitely I will never marry. Now, that's the, those are the trends. That is what is happening in America today. Now, also what we know is the concept of dating has changed over the years. It's not the same. You know, one of the myths about dating is that people have always been dating forever. That's not true. You know, the, this thing that we call dating has only been around a little bit over 100 years. Because before that, every aspect of male and female interaction was really regulated by the adults, by the parents. Everything was arranged, including marriage. And there were rules regarding physical contact, the use of chaperones, courtship, engagement. There were some very specific rules over 100 years that don't really apply that much anymore today. So historically, when you look at dating, there was a time that it was a family decision. Now, what do I mean by that? The boy and the girl had no say-so. You know what? Most of the time, boy and the girl met on the day they were married. And the idea was that something as serious as marriage couldn't be left up to young people. It was way too serious to let them decide on that. And by the way, that is still the case in some of the countries and some of the cultures around the world. Marriages are prearranged. Kids have nothing to say with it, about it. And then, uh, there, it became, historically, it became a personal decision with family blessing. You know, during the, the 1800s, it began to change, and a man was able to marry when he could support a family with his income. And many believe that love developed only after marriage, not before. You know, they, when they talked about love back then, uh, love meant not romantic love, which was childish to them, but it meant love where you're committed, you committed to somebody for the rest of their lives. And during this time, the decision to marry was a personal one, but the family blessing was very important. And one of the practices that we saw up to recently was that, you know, uh, you didn't go and ask your parents if you got married, but one of the things that the guy would do is that he would go to the parent of the bride and ask for her hand in marriage. And it was usually a very formal occasion. And if dad said no, it was no. That's the way it was at one time. Now today, it's a, it's a personal decision and with no parent, parental blessing. In other words, uh, today, young people decide to get married and if dad blesses them and mom blesses them good, if they're not good with it, that's good. We're going to get married and if you want to show up, you can. The only time they contact mom and dad is when they want mom and dad to pay for it. Then you have a little say-so. You have a little, a little bit of input. But you know what's interesting? In the 1900s, things begin to change. That's what began to happen. And one of the inventions that sort of had an impact on dating was the invention of the car. You know, people could get away and, uh, you know, do whatever they wanted. But we're living in days today where young people make the decision to marry or live together outside of marriage without much regard to what parents think. You know, they're not, it doesn't matter. And what more and more young people are doing today is living together before marriage. And it's widely accepted. And it, you know, it's interesting, even in the church, it's not something that's only outside, it's something that's inside the church. You'll find Christians that go to church every Sunday and they're not married, they're living together. Now, why? We have to ask ourselves, why? Why is that happening? I, I don't know about you, but it, it, it interests me. You know, about 30%, according to studies, about 30% of those living uh, uh, together outside of marriage, they tell us that 30% of them will eventually marry 20% of the couples will break up, and 32% will stay living together and never get married, have children, and never go through the formalities of marriage. Now, why? Why are more couples choosing to live together instead of getting married? What are the reasons? Now, this is what, when they're asked, this is what they say. 
This is not the experts. This is not the counselors. This is not psychologists that are saying this. These are people that are cohabiting in common law relationships that they are saying this. Number one, the number one reason is that it's cheaper. And you say, well, what does that mean? In other words, what it means is if you are a young person and you want to live independently from your parents and you can't afford it, get a roommate. And usually the roommate you're going to get is your romantic partner or your boyfriend and your girlfriend. So living together, what it does, it provides an attractive alternative, you know what, to live on your own without parental authority and without the rules. And a lot of young people want to get out from under their parents because they don't like the rules. I want to do what I want, when I want, come when I want, go as I want. And under the parents, they can't do that. So I'm going to move out. I can't afford it. So it's cheaper to bring in a roommate. And that is usually my boyfriend. That's, that's the number one response. That's why they do it. Interesting. The second reason why they're living together is because it provides some sense of what it's like to be married and live together. In other words, it's a trial run. It's trying the car before I buy it. It's putting on the shoes before I buy the shoes. You know, many young people believe that living together first can really give you a better perspective of what it's going to be like to be married to that person. But you know what's interesting? Studies have shown and everything has shown that living together has no predictive effect on whether or not a marriage will last. People who live together and, and, and uh, get divorced at the same rate as those that have never lived together. It really isn't a dress rehearsal for marriage. Get that out of your mind. Well, you know, we're going to see what we're like. You know, you know what? Even if you say we're good, it still has no impact on it. Here's the third reason. One person, the idea when asked, why do you do that? This is what they say. One person may not satisfy me for the rest of my life. And here's the thinking. The thinking is that the person that makes me happy when I'm in my 20s may not be the same person who makes me happy when I'm in my 30s. You know, we change. You know what? We sort of grow and we mature, metamorphosize, you know. And uh, as I go through my metamorphosis and my growing and my maturing, maybe this one isn't who I want at this stage of my life or at this stage of my life. So why commit? Why get married when honestly they say, I'm probably not going to have the same woman or guy that I had 10 years ago. So why go through the trouble? So the thinking is, you know what? I don't want a lifetime commitment to someone who might not make me happy at that stage of my life because it's really all about me. It's about my happiness. It's about what I want. Now, that's very interesting if you really think about that. And the fourth reason why they're living together more is because social stigma has disappeared. You know, there was a time not too long ago when living together outside of marriage was scandalous. Today is not scandalous. It's much more acceptable today than it used to be. You know, there's now no longer do you have to go to family gatherings and, you know, have the shame and the guilt poured on and why are you doing that? Except maybe grandma and grandpa and great-grandma and great-grandpa. But everybody else, it's like, oh, well, it's cool. Everybody's doing it. So it's much more acceptable. And that's what we're seeing today. But here's the interesting thing that we're finding out and counselors are and, and psychologists are finding out is that what do you do when that roommate that doesn't meet your needs after 10 years, what do you do? Well, you get rid of them. That's what you do. And that's a very painful experience. You know, after five years, six years, all of a sudden, the partner, whether it's the guy or the girl, said, you know what? You don't meet my needs anymore. And then you have to leave because it's not working out. And they find themselves heartbroken and homeless. But you know what's even more fascinating? Within a couple of months, there's someone to replace them. There's someone else living with them. Wow, that's pretty amazing. You know, because really, it's, uh, you know what? We're, we're going to take advantage of each other while we meet each other's needs. And once you don't meet my needs, you're out of here. I'm going to kick you out. And then those who do stay together and eventually get married, like I told you earlier, 30% of them experience the same rate of divorce as all other marriages. Fascinating. You know, it's interesting, they were asked, young, young people who are looking to get married, they were asked, what do you want in a spouse? What are you looking for? The number one answer that never married women, when asked that question, this is what they said. They said the important thing that we're looking for in a spouse, 78% said we want somebody who has a job, a steady job. Very important to them. They find somebody with a job. When the guys were asked how, is important, how important is a job in a woman to you and men, 46% of men said that was important to them. But the number one response was women. We want guys with a job. So guys, you want to be a good candidate for for, for dating and marriage one day, get a job. Amen. Get a good job, a steady job. 
The second thing, 62% of never married men, when they were asked, what's your number one thing you're looking for in a spouse? This is what they said. 62% said, you know what? I want someone who shares my ideas about raising children. I want someone that we see, I, I, I want children. And you know why they say that? Because a lot of girls are getting married not wanting children. So these guys says, I want somebody who wants children, and we agree that we want them, and we agree about how we're going to raise them. But here's what I found interesting in the data that's out there about people that are not married and what they want. What was interesting in the survey was that never married adults, whether male or female, they place a much lower priority on finding a partner who shares their moral and religious beliefs. That didn't matter. Had similar educational backgrounds. That didn't matter. And I tell you that because at one time that was very important. Or they don't really care whether they come from the same racial or ethnic background which at one time was huge. Very interesting. But here's what I want to say to you today as we begin to look at the art of dating. Getting married changes everything. You know what? Nothing affects your life more than marrying. Why? Very simply, because it's no longer about you. Now it's about your partner, and if God allows you to have children, you know what? Now it's about your children. And once you're married, it becomes less and less about you and more and more about her and them. And there are times where you are giving more than what actually at times you feel you're getting. And there are times where in marriage where you feel, you know, I'm getting way more than what I'm getting. Absolutely. That's the way it works. You know, because there's so much to give in marriage. And it changes your life. You know, Christian psychologist and educator and theologian, Dr. Neil Warren Clark, he's the founder of eHarmony. He was a, he's a psychologist and he worked with thousands of married couples. And after working with thousands of married couples in the 60s and the 70s, he concluded this. He concluded that the single greatest factor for success in marriage is making the right initial selection of a partner. And what he found was that highly compatible couples can generally handle whatever life throws at them. But couples who were very different from each other, they struggled with the slightest obstacles and problems that came against their marriage. In his research, this is what he found. He found that people that have common things, more compatibilities, more things in common, have a better chance of being successful at marriage than those who don't have things in common. So what he did is he came up with this, you know, online dating called eHarmony. And it's an online compatibility matching service. In other words, he brings people together based on commonalities, compatibilities, you know, things they have in common. And, you know, and, and they get together and they have found, he has found that those couples have huge amount of success in their marriage. They've been following them for the last 15, 20 years. And they have found it's very successful. And as a result of his research, he has come up, he's a theologian, he's a Christian, he's a psychologist. He's come up with a couple of principles for dating. And I, part of what I'm going to share with you from this point on come from his research, comes from his research. And... Uh, so here's the first one. First principle, if you're out dating and looking for a date, here's number one. Often the decision to marry is made way too quickly. In other words, not only Dr. Neil Warren Clark found this out, but studies have shown, you know, studies after studies, you know, done on married couples show that a strong trend, a strong pattern exists between long courtships and satisfying marriages. And an equal trend or a pattern of, of, of short dating time and Breaking, breaking marriages, marriages that don't make it. In other words, there are, if you haven't been dating for a long time, you know, short, marriage, short dating creates for difficult uh, uh, marriages. Now, there are exceptions to the rule. Those of you that know Chuck Swindoll, Charles Swindoll, Insight for Living, uh, a guy on the radio, he tells a story of how he met his wife, Cynthia. And within a couple of weeks, he proposed to her, and they were married, you know what, within a couple of months after that. Now he's been married 60 years. I don't know. So there are exceptions. Let me tell you my story. I met my wife, and after a couple of months, I proposed. And we were married within seven and eight months, seven to eight months, 42 years ago. Amen. We are an exception to the rule. Amen. So, yes, please. She has put up a lot with me in 42 years. Amen. But here's the principle. Here's what you need to know. If you're going to date, you know what? When dating, go slow. Listen, every month you extend your dating will either affirm the health of the relationship or erode the confidence that you have in it. 
Now, people ask me, well, Pastor Victor, in your opinion, what is a healthy time that people should date before they get married? Well, it depends. It depends on your age. It depends on the individuals. But for sure, without exceptions, no one should get married without having at least dated for a year. At least. I mean, if you're younger, it should be two, three, four years, in my opinion. Why? You say, well, Pastor, why? Because there's so much to learn about each other. One of the purposes of dating is to get to know the other person. You know what? Discover who they are. Discover who you are. And don't be in a hurry. And there, you, know, there's a, uh, you know, go slow. Don't, don't go fast. And a lot of people are way too, too, too eager and, you know, to do it. I'm going to talk to you about that in a few minutes. So here's the second principle for dating. The decision to marry is made at too young of an age. People get married way too young. You know, one of the things that we know is that teenage marriages have a 90% chance of failing. You know what? Resulting in divorce. 90% teenagers. And you say, well, why do you think that's true? Well, I'll tell you why. It's the same reason why we don't let three-year-olds play with knives or 10-year-olds drive cars or 12-year-olds vote. It's very simply, very simple. Developmentally, they're not capable of making good decisions at those ages. Developmental experts, they tell us that we're not fully mature mature until the age of 27. Let me say that very slow. We men and women a little bit younger mature. Something happens in the brain where we get it. And it doesn't happen for guys until the age of about 27 and girls about the age 24, 25. I say, well, Pastor, what are you talking about? What does that mean? It means that most young people are still doing intense identification work. In other words, they're still trying to figure out who they are up to the age of 27. Questions like, who am I? You know what? They're learning to establish independence from their parents. They're learning to survive. You know what? Stand on their own feet without parents around. That's what they're learning to do. They're doing what developmental experts call core work. They're figuring themselves out. You know, what's life about? Trying to figure life out. They're asking, you know, what, what am I going to build my life on? What will be the foundation of my life? You know, my parents gave me these values. I'm learning these other values from my friends, and I'm learning these values from school. Which ones will I use? Which will be the foundation of my life? What will I build my life on? And at age 27, psychologists tell us that, you know what, you're barely beginning to figure that out. You're figuring out what you're good at, what career you're going to pursue, What competencies do I have to build my life around? And then you add to that spiritual formation. You know what? They're struggling with that. You know, what? I grew up in a Christian home. My parents are Christians. Will I be a a fully committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or will I be a casual Christian? Or, you know, or will I simply identify with my faith of Christianity? Or, Or will I make a decision to just reject it totally? And, and, you know, and religion altogether. And it's at that age where you are dealing with that and you are asking yourselves those questions. You know, these are major issues. The young people are are working out in their mid-20s. And then you throw them into a marriage? You know what? With all its complexities and all the intense work that marriage itself takes, you know what? It's enough to ask for problems. And you're asking for problems if that's what you do. And that's what's happening today because people are marrying way too young. They're experiencing all of these problems. And that's why it's better to wait until you have gotten your head together. That's why you'll hear one of the excuses that people want out of their marriage. This is what they'll say. You know what? I, I got to find myself. They're not lying. They just, they, the way they express it doesn't sound good. But they have, they're trying to find themselves. You know what? I, I need to get my head on straight. They're right. But here's what I'm telling you. They should have done it before they got married. Can I hear a good amen to that? Avoid all the pain for you and all the pain for your spouse. And if there's children, all the pain for the children. So principle number one, go slow. Principle two, grow up first. And then find a partner that's grown up and mature. Don't assume that because they have a body of an adult that they're mature and grown up. They're not. Number three, sometimes one or more parties are just too eager to get married. You know what? One of the things that you're hearing today, while all my friends are getting married, they seem so happy, and people get marriage fever. You know, they look at their lives and they say, I'm tired of being alone, so they think the answer is I got to get married. Married will, marriage will relieve my aloneness. It will heal my brokenness. It will ensure my happiness. You know what? It's going to give me some, I look around and I see my, and when we get together, they're all so happy, but you know what? When they're with you, they put their best face forward. You don't know what goes on when they go home. 
And I tell you, they're not as happy as what they appear when they're with you. Some people think that, you know what, all, all that's bad in my life is going to disappear if I just get married. And I want to say to you this morning, nothing's further from the truth. Listen to me, and I'm going to say it slow because this is important. If you're lonely, if you're unhappy, if you're miserable as a single person, walking down an aisle isn't going to solve that. Let me tell you what marriage is going to do. It's going to add to that. It's going to magnify your aloneness, your unhappiness. It's going to magnify everything that you're experiencing. And it's going to blow your mind. And you're going to say, how can this be? I'll tell you how it is. Marriage was never designed to make you happy. You've got to learn to be happy by yourself. You have to be a happy camper before you get married. And what marriage should do is add to your happiness. But if you're putting all your eggs in marriage to be happy, man, you're going to be disappointed. But some people, that's what they do. So here's principle number three. Don't be in a hurry. Be a healthy, well-rounded individual and find a healthy person with which you can relate and hopefully share the rest of your life with. Can I hear an amen to that? Here's number four. Many couples prematurely get married to please parents and their peers. You know, you go to a family reunion or you go to a wedding and God forbid you catch the bouquet or the garter, you know, because then people are going to say, oh, you're next. <laughs> or you go to the wedding and grandma goes, mijo, you're not, no, you're not married yet. <laughs> and you're like, no, grandma, I'm not married yet. Well, how old are you? Well, I'm 28. Oh, you're, if you're a girl, you're an old mate. The train has passed you. You're never going to get married. All right. So what happens is, you know, pressure's on. I got to find somebody. And after a while, there's people out there just seeking anyone. You know what? And if they get you in their crosshair or in their sides, guys or gals, you're in trouble because they want to get married. There's a lot of people out there that to please their peers and to parents and to come off like, you know what? I got it together and I know you. I have it what it takes to get married. You know what? They'll razzle dazzle you. They'll manipulate you because they want to get married. Don't be surprised on the second date is, when are we going to get married? Amen. You say, well, pastor, how, how can I tell if, 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 if that's the case? There'll be, there'll be eagerness on steroids. You'll know <laughs> right away. Yikes. I got to run. Right, so pull out your skateboard and take off. Amen. <laughs> really. They're eager. So don't be over eager to get married. Here's principle number four. Here it is. Don't get married to please other people. Get married because you're ready. Because you're the right person and you have found the right person. If it's at 26, 25, it's at 30, it doesn't matter. That's why we get married. Here's number five. The other major problem is that people get married and really don't know each other. And sometimes you could have been dating them for a long time. It's, it's definitely true when the courtships are short. There's no way you can know everything about somebody. But even sometimes, even if it's a long courtship, they don't know each other. They don't know uh, much about their eternal strength. You know, they don't know about how do they deal with the, uh, a full range of life experiences. So a lot of people walk down the aisle of a church with someone that they have had very narrow life experiences with. And later on, they're surprised. And the surprises are not pleasant. So here's principle number five. Make sure you know who you're married. Ask yourself, find out, how do they handle pressures? Do they have a problem with anger? And if they do, how do they handle anger? Disappointments, temptation. Are they... Are they, you know, do they have addictions like alcohol, like drugs, like pornography? Because you know what? I hear a couple, they say, well, I, I got married. I didn't know. I didn't know he had a problem with alcohol. What do you mean you didn't know? How did you not know? Oh, we don't pay attention. That's how we do not know. Here's number six. I could talk to you a lot about that, but let's move on. Later on, another message, we'll talk more about that. Another mistake that many couples make is that of unrealistic expectations of marriage or uncommunicated expectations. In other words, what they want out of marriage, what they expect out of marriage, you know, what, what they believe marriage should, be, should look like, you know, and ask, and can this person fulfill, can this person deliver what I expect, what I want, you know, and can I deliver? Because most couples who get married think it's just going to happen automatically. You know, it's just going to happen. You know, we're going to be happy. You know, finances are going to work out. Decisions are going to work out. Where we spend the holidays, what the in-laws is going to, it's all going to work out. Because this is the way guys, ladies, let me tell you how guys think. This is how guys think when they get married. All I know is that she's going to be around and I'm going to be able to have sex with her every day, three times on Saturday and twice on Sunday. And I'm good. (laughs) 
wrong. We assume it's all going to be okay. It's all going to work out. You know, some of you assumed some stuff and you found out you should have discussed it before the fact. You should have spent more time reviewing this stuff. It's very important to have clear, realistic expectations of what you're looking for in marriage. And then ask yourself, can he or, or can she meet those expectations? I mean, how much freedom are we going to have in this relationship? How many friends are we allowed to have? What will be our roles? Who's going to handle stuff? All of this should be discussed. Because here's what happened. The guy says, well, honey, you're going to handle the finances. And she has no clue about how to handle finances. And a year down the road, because you're not monitoring it, credit cards are all the time high, bills aren't being paid, and you're wondering, what are you doing? Well, I'll tell you what she's doing. She doesn't know how to pay bills, and you never inquired about that. And if she probably let you do it, you'd probably do a worse job, too, because you don't know how either. But those are things that were not clear. Get it clear before the fact. Discuss it before, not after the wedding. Because after the wedding, when you want to discuss these things, it sounds like you've got control issues. It sounds like you want to manipulate. You want to control everything. And you're like, I just want to discuss this because we didn't discuss it. We weren't clear. We need to be on the same page. No, you're a control freak. That's what begins to happen. You know, for some couples, what I have found, I've done hundreds of weddings, counseled hundreds of couples, premarital and afterwards. And for some couples, you know what the goal is? You know what their goal is? Is the wedding day. No, the most important thing is what happens after the wedding day. So here's principle number six. Plan your marriage more than you plan your wedding. Talk about it. And that takes time. Have those difficult conversations. You know, and if one of your partners, if your partner doesn't want to have it, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. And take it. Believe it. Believe what they tell you. I don't want to discuss it. There's a reason they don't want to discuss it. But one day you're going to have to discuss it. And here's the last one. Another major mistake in the courtship and selection process is unaddressed personality or behavioral problems, dysfunctions, idiosyncrasies that don't get uncovered or ignored during dating. You know, all of a sudden you're married and you realize, man, there's some damage. By the way, all of us, all of us come to marriage damaged, broken, with issues, with some little weird idiosyncrasies. All of us do. All right? But here's what I... And forgive. I'm going to use an analogy. Forgive it. It's a bad analogy. But in my simple brain, this is the only way I can see it. If you go and you buy a used car, you don't go buy a used car just because of the price. You want to make sure it's in good shape. And by the way, whether we've been married before or not, we come to marriage used and with prior history. But when you go and you buy a car, you make sure it hasn't been in a wreck. You make sure that the engine is still good. Today, you can go and get a Carfax report that gives you all the, that information. Who owns it? Who has owned it? You know what? Uh, has it been in an accident? Has, been, has it been totaled? Has it been salvaged? Has it been in a flood? Because you know all of these cars that the insurance totals, they sell them to people who fix them up, and then they sell them to you like new, like they're good used cars. But they've been in floods, the, the, the chassis is all crooked, and you're driving, and you're going like this, and you're wondering, why is it going like this? Because it's been in a serious accident. And, and this Carfax gives you everything, the, uh, the uh, odometer reading, because sometimes they'll go and change it to make you believe it has less miles. Everything's there. If it's been a lemon, it'll give you the lemon history, because they have to report that. Anybody in their common sense will go and find out about that car. Because not knowing this stuff is an invitation for surprises of the worst kind. And they cause a lot of problems. And that's what happens in, in marriage. During dating, spend long hours in conversation, serious conversations. You know, be honest about the bumps and the bruises and the twists and the turns that you have experienced in life. And some of them have been tough. Make sure that all that information is out there because you might hide it, but it's going to come out one day and it's going to create a lot of hurt in you and those that you love. You owe it to each other to be honest so that when, you're, when your mate decides they want to get married, they're making a decision to get married based on all the information, not on surprises. 
You know, I don't know about you, but I, I want to suggest to you that before you go out as you're dating and you go out and get uh, married and you know there's been a lot of damage done to that individual, whether they, somebody did it to them, they did it to themselves, or life did it to them, you make sure that it's been corrected, it's been straightened out, they've gotten past it, because if not, whether it's emotional, psychological, spiritual, whatever it may be, otherwise it's going to create major issues in your marriage. Does it ring a bell with any of you? Sound familiar? Don't raise your hands. Don't even nod. Don't bump your neighbor because uh, they're going to feel uncomfortable. <laughs> but the truth is, as we hear this, all of us are saying, yeah. Pastor, you're 20 years too late. I know. It's never too late. <laughs> you're five years too late. Never too late. Some of you are whispering to your spouse, honey, we violated all seven of those things. Man, what are we going to do? Let me end by saying that uh, we go out and we make some bad decisions and bad choices. And then we want to blame God. I'm tired of talking to people that come to me and say, Pastor, why did God allow that guy to come into my life? Or that girl, that psycho girl into my life? Where was God? Why did God allow? And I'm tired of hearing that. And I'm like, you made the choice, not God. You didn't do your homework. You messed up. Why are we blaming God for this? But you know, it's easy to blame someone else rather than take responsibility. It was 20 years ago that Princess Diana died there in Paris, France in an automobile accident. And shortly after her death, a minister was interviewed and was asked this question. How can God allow such a terrible tragedy? The min I like his response. The minister said, could it have had something to do with the drunk driver going 90 miles an hour in a narrow tunnel? Just exactly explain to me, reporter, how was God involved? You asked me, tell me what. No, God had nothing to do with it, but we want to blame God. By the way, Pacquiao won that fight last night. Amen. He got robbed. And I tell you that because several years ago, Ray Boom Boom Mancini, he killed a Korean opponent. They were boxing and he, he hit him in the head and he killed him. And after the, after the fight, the press conference asked him, well, what do you think? And this is what Mancini said, and I'm quoting. He said, sometimes I wonder why God does the things he does. And I'm like, no, why did you hit him solid right? Uh, uh, don't blame God for that. One of my favorite guys is Dr. James Dobson. And one day to his talk show, a, a young woman asked this, this anguished question. She said, Dr. Dobson, four years ago I was dating a man and I became pregnant. I'm devastated. I'm asking God, why have you allowed this to happen to me, God? He didn't answer it, but by what I said, because you're having sex with them. That's why he allowed, that's why it's happening. But isn't it amazing that we don't like to take responsibility? You know, recently we heard about this young boy that they found yesterday that his father killed him. And we sort of asked ourselves why. But I don't know if you remember, over 20 years ago, Susan Smith, South Carolina mother, drove her car, pushed her two kids into a lake and drowned them. And then she blamed it on this fictional carjacker for what he did. But finally she confessed. And in her confession, this is what she wrote. She said, I dropped to the lowest point when I allowed my children to go down that ramp into the water without me. I took off running and screaming, oh God, oh God, no, what have I done? Why did you let this happen? We do that all the time. So the question is, what role did God really have in all of this? Well, I'll tell you what the truth of the matter, I'll tell you what the answer is. We want to blame God. But what that speaks to is that we have free will. We have, we have the right to make choices. And as we make choices, sometimes we make bad choices. And yes, we live in a world, a fallen world, full of sin, full of evil, full of liars, full of deceit, all of that. And sometimes we're, we're victims of that. That is true. But there are decisions. And we cannot blame God. You cannot blame your parents. You can't blame the pastor. You can't blame the church. You can't blame Trump. You made the choice. The Republicans clapped, the Democrats says, what is he talking about? Amen. <laughs> Listen, here's what I'm telling you. <laughs> you can choose to ignore, you can reject, you can rebel. And we're going to be talking more about what God's word says about dating. And let me, let me warn you ahead of time. What God says about dating is not what the world says about dating. 
and we follow what the world says and we do it the way society and the philosophy of the world and we ignore God. And listen, when we ignore God, we, you have the right to. You have the right, you have the choice to say, God, you're outdated. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to do it. My, you have the right and we respect that right. But you don't have the right to choose the consequences. You will face the consequences of your bad choice. This is what I learned. I've learned that I, I want to listen to God. You know, my wife and I got married when I was two weeks. I was two weeks from 19 when I married my wife. According to the statistics, 90% is I shouldn't have made it. But you know why we made it? I'll tell you why we made it. Not because we're good people or amazing people. God was number one in our lives. We wanted to honor God. And as we learned about the adjustments that needed to be done, we made those adjustments with God's help. We had a commitment to the Lord, and 42 years later, we still do. And I'll tell you, it has not only helped our marriage, it has blessed our marriage, it has blessed our family. But so many times, we want to do it our way. You can, and some of you will and are, but you'll face the consequences of that. It's not God's fault. It's your choice. Can I hear a good amen to that? <laughs> amen, amen. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, and uh, we'll continue next week. Same bad channels, bad station, and uh, <laughs> we'll continue. Father, thank you for uh, allowing us to come together today. And this is a serious topic, Lord. And those of us that have children and grandchildren at a dating age, it concerns us. So, Lord, we ask for your help and uh, give us ears to hear and a heart to humble ourselves to receive from you. Um, we're bombarded every day, Lord, with many messages, many of them contrary to what you say. And what confuses us is that more are doing not what you say, they're doing what the message of the world is. And Lord, as we explore this topic from a biblical point, help us to follow you. Um, it requires great discipline. It requires great commitment. There's a huge price to play up front. But at the tail end, we reap the benefits of good choices. I pray that you bless our young people that are dating. I pray you bless our marriages because we talked to both today. And there are some here today, Lord, that are wondering, is there hope for my marriage? And Lord, to that we say, of course, with God all things are possible. So Father, we pray. I pray your blessing. I do so in Jesus' name. Amen.